Oh my god, guys, did I not just say in my previous episode that if things could just calm down for like five minutes, then I could, I could stop covering things. But holy crap, here we are again. Chinese malware could cut power to U.S. military bases, businesses, and homes report claims. What the heck is even going on right now? I'm sure that over the past couple days, a number of you have probably seen a number of different articles on the internet that are talking about the events that I'm about to describe to you right now. But the gist of it can be explained in this top line right here. The Biden administration believes China has installed malware on U.S. networks that could affect military operations and other domestic communications. If that is indeed the case, then this is a serious point in history that we are going to be remembering for years after. Because my friends, the potential of what they're talking about here is absolutely huge. You're talking about something that whether it's American deployment, or infrastructure or operations, anything could be affected, slowed down, or really anything could happen to them because of this. In particular, with the heightened tensions that are going on between China and Taiwan, who can really say what is going to happen if this ends up getting triggered? Mind you, what we're going to be talking about here today is going to be a mixture between news and history. So the things that I'm going to be talking about here in the beginning are more on the news side, and a lot of the stuff is not necessarily confirmed. It's just stuff that is believed, considering what it is that people have found. So take anything that I say right now here with a pinch of salt. I'm not going to speculate or do anything like that. I'm merely going to go off the reports as they have come out. But before we get things started today, I would like to thank today's sponsor, Atlas VPN. I'm going to say this right now, people, but as a person whose job it is to use the internet all the time, I know for a fact that it's not very safe. And when you're browsing and trying to get information from one part of the internet to the other, there is a chance that hackers and other malcontent actors are going to come after your information. And that's where Atlas VPN comes in to protect you. But Atlas VPN isn't just protecting you. It's simultaneously going to give you access to media all over the world because you're able to change your location to that specific country in order to get access to their particular media. Another bonus that many people don't realize is that because you're able to change your location, this means you can effectively change your purchasing power, putting yourself in a country where your money is going to be able to go further and buy more stuff. All these features and more you're going to be able to use across unlimited devices, which is awesome. And the entire thing is super affordable. If you use my link down in the description below, then you can get three years plus three additional months for free for the price of around $1.83 a month. Which, considering your safety and all the features that this thing has, that is an incredible deal. But if you do try it and you don't really care for it, then don't worry, it's not a waste. There's a 30-day money-back guarantee. So come on, guys, get yourself some protection, stay clean, because we are going to be diving into the most nasty parts of history. Atlas VPN, thank you very much for sponsoring this video. But what is going on is that the Biden administration is hunting for malicious computer code that it specifically believes that China has hidden deep inside of its network's power grids in an effort to try and disrupt U.S. military and civilian operations. These would be all the different aspects that control water supply, communications, anything that you can think of for military bases or for civilian infrastructure, all of this can be affected. And the discovery of the malware has now raised fears that Chinese hackers that are working with the People's Liberation Army have specifically inserted this code in order to make sure that the United States will be disrupted in the event that some type of conflict or operation or anything across the world breaks out, in particular looking at a place like Taiwan. Now, when I am talking about this, we are not saying that this is a sign that a conflict is going to break out soon, rather that this discovery appears to have been a discovery of a trap that could be laid for something to break out in the future at some point in time. If that sounds vague, it's because it precisely is. You wouldn't know whether that is a week from now, a year from now, or a decade from now, it could be any of it. What that means that we are describing is a malware that is effectively a type of ticking time bomb. Something that is capable of giving China the power to interrupt or slow American military deployments or resupply operations by cutting off power, water, communications, anything to U.S. military bases that could potentially disrupt them. But the impact of what we were talking about is likely something that is far greater than just the impact to the military. The same infrastructure that is being used for a number of American military bases are simultaneously the same things that would oftentimes supply businesses, homes, and in general, the day-to-day -day activities of the civilian population. That is a really big deal. Now, of course, I just said that this is a big deal, but simultaneously, when we were talking about this, although this is a new development in the story, this is not the first time that we have actually heard of this. We had an idea of this when it was first announced back in May that some type of malware had been found, but the scope of it is far greater than anything that we had initially imagined. If we go back to May of 2023, then Microsoft and the NSA, the National Security Agency, revealed that there was an alleged Chinese state-sponsored hacking group called Volt Typhoon that was going and hacking 
lacking key infrastructure inside of Guam. This is a group that has been operating since mid-2021 and reportedly has compromised government organizations as well as communications, manufacturing, education, and other sectors. They have been active in many different places all over the United States in every kind of industry that you can imagine. And Volt Typhoon is a rather interesting organization because this is not something that is generally speaking used for attacking. It's something that prioritizes specifically stealth. They will use the command line to scrape credentials and other data and then archive that information for use in later possible infiltration attacks. They also try to mask their activity by sending data traffic through small and home office network hardware that they control. Things like routers or other stuff like that. Not any kind of major networks. Through this and custom tools that they have allow them to set up a command and control channel through a proxy that will help keep all their information secret. They're very low key in general for how they operate, which just makes this entire thing that much more surprising. Because while from all of this there have been no actual attacks yet, it hasn't activated, the potential is still definitely there to be done. And also when we were looking at this, this is probably not something that is isolated. It's probably something that is part of a grander scheme of operations that have already been occurring. US officials, when talking Talking about this have said that the whole Guam infiltration is probably part of a larger Chinese intelligence collection system that includes the reported spy balloons from earlier this year. With this development back in May being all the more concerning because we're talking about the Anderson Air Force Base in Guam, a place that is a major station that would likely be used for US answers to a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. This right here is also a key hub for ships moving in and out of the Pacific. It's a place that is of key strategic importance to the United States and its allies. From all of this, more than a dozen U.S. officials and industry experts said in interviews over the past two months that the Chinese effort goes far beyond telecommunication systems, and it also predates the May report by at least a year. Meaning all of the stuff that we talked about with Guam, that is not even the beginning of it, and nor is the Chinese spy balloon. This has been going on for apparently quite a while. They said the U.S. government's effort to hunt down the code and eradicate it has been underway for some time, with most speaking on the condition of anonymity, 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 anonymity. That's the word, anonymity. In order to be able to discuss confidential and in some case classified assessments. As I already talked about earlier in the video, the investigations that they had so far show that the Chinese efforts are significantly more widespread than initially anticipated. It's not just going after military bases, but also civilian infrastructure as well. But officials really don't know how far all of this extends. That's the worst and scariest part about all of it. They do not know the full extent of the code's presence in networks because the thing is just that incredibly well hidden. The discovery of this malware has now touched off a series of situation room meetings in the White House in recent months, as senior officials from the National Security Council, the Pentagon, the Homeland Security Department, and the nation's spy agencies all try to figure out exactly what kind of extent of damage is possible here and what is even going on in the first place. Of course, since all of this is going on, the Biden administration has now begun to brief members of Congress, as well as some state governors, as well as utility companies, with their individual findings. The general belief is that the source of this malware came from China, but simultaneously the real concern of the administration as it stands is not really where did it come from, but what is the extent of the damage that it can do, and how are we going to be able to deal with it. As such, US officials say that initial searches for the code have primarily focused on areas with high concentration of American military personnel and bases. Which, naturally, considering what it is that we're talking about, has caused quite a stir, and as a result of it, the government has had to come forward and give some kind of explanation to the people as to what exactly is going on. With the quote from the government being, the Biden administration is working relentlessly to defend the United States from any disruptions to our critical infrastructure, including by coordinating intra-agency efforts to protect water systems, pipelines, lines rail aviation systems among others said adam r hodge the acting spokesman for the national security council he also added that the president has also mandated rigorous cybersecurity practices for the first time and in this case he's referring to a series of executive orders that were motivated by concerns from solar winds which was the uh, the commercial software that was used by the u.s government that ended up being exploited by russian hackers a couple years ago yeah that whole attack was a real serious business and resulted in the cutoff of about half of the gas gasoline, jet fuel, and diesel supplies that ran up all along the East Coast. That, that was a massive thing when that whole thing broke out. 
Now, over the course of talking about all this, as I said earlier, we have said China quite a lot. China for everything. Chinese hackers, Chinese, well, everything. But as I said, we don't necessarily know that that is the case. What we're going off of here is the news, off of Microsoft, and off of what the government is saying. And all that being said, this is the probable answer in all of this, but we cannot be 100% certain. The government hasn't really disclosed how it came to the conclusion that Chinese hackers are responsible for this. The debate that is currently Currently going on in different arms of the government is not necessarily where the source came from, but rather, what is the intent of these intrusions? And of course, it doesn't really help that the moment that anything on this is released to the public, that this happens at the exact time that tensions between the United States and China are arguably at one of their high points in recent years. Whether we are talking about over the years the Chinese threats against Taiwan, American efforts to ban the sale of highly sophisticated semiconductors to the Chinese government, or the whole spy balloon incident, among other things. Like, just in general, things between the United States and China have only gotten more tense as the years have passed. But also when we are talking about the tension in this relationship, Relationship, it is not something that is only driven by technological competition or anything like that, but also from mutual accusations of spying through cyber attacks. Like, yeah, the United States has blamed China for a variety of major attacks against U.S. agencies and infrastructure over the years. And from everything that has been found, and we've talked about multiple times on this channel, there have been many different points in which exactly this occurred. But simultaneously, for its part, China also accuses the United States of being the one that is primarily doing all of these cyber attacks attacks. With the big thing that America has been accused of being hacking the Chinese mega corporation Huawei in order to be able to spy on it and collect data. And funnily enough, on that note, this is actually kind of true because secret documents that were released a decade ago by Edward Snowden, the former national security agency contractor that is now in exile in Russia. Yeah, these documents that he had confirmed that American intelligence agencies did do precisely that. Like this is something that has regularly happened. But in everything that we've been talking about in this rivalry, the focus of all of it has always been information information gathering, actual spy work. The discovery of malicious code that is actually seeking to harm things within American infrastructure, well, that that is an escalation to a whole new stage in a cybersecurity conflict. And it really does raise the question of what exactly is China preparing for at that moment? Because if the entire purpose of all of this is specifically to slow down the American military so that China is able to take Taiwan without American interference at first, then this very well could be possible because with a malware attack like that, it could potentially slow the American response by several weeks. Of course, we're talking about all that right now as a possibility, but the thing is, China has refused any such statement saying that all of it is false. The embassy in Washington issued a statement on Saturday after the publication of the article revealing all of this in the New York Times, denying that it engages in hacking and also accusing the United States of being the far larger offender, saying, and I quote, we have always firmly opposed and cracked down on all forms of cyber attacking in accordance with the law, which is really funny because as you all know, as we have covered multiple times in this channel, that is definitely not the case. If anyone is wondering about this, just go back and look at the video that I did on the C-17. It's just, it's, the whole thing is ridiculous. But again, the quote goes further, saying, the Chinese government agencies face numerous cyber attacks every day, most of which come from sources inside of the United States. We hope relevant parties will stop smearing China with groundless accusations. Yeah, the funny thing about all this is that Chinese officials have never once conceded that China was behind the theft of a variety of different things, including the security clearance files of roughly 22 million Americans, including 6 million sets of fingerprints from the Office of Personal Management during the Obama administration. That was a thing that did actually happen. And because all of that occurred and got called out, as I believe I've mentioned before in a previous video, this ended up resulting in an agreement between President Obama and President Xi Jinping that resulted resulted at that point in a brief decline of malicious cyber attacks between the two parties. Of course, as we all know, when I say the word brief, that whole agreement didn't last for very long. But now, of course, that we're talking about this, Chinese cyber operations seem to have taken a turn because no longer is this something about stealing information. It's actually instead something that is directly meant to cause disruption. And so, okay, awesome. Well, now we've talked about the news as it happened here today, but the thing is, this is a history page. And I need people that are watching this right now to understand just how monumental of a thing this is, just how big of a deal and important to history something like this occurring is. Which is why I figured, okay, let's go ahead and talk some history when it comes to malware and viruses and other stuff that the United States has been involved in. But before we do that, for anyone who is a little bit more computer illiterate, I feel like I need to explain at least the beginning of this for what exactly a virus is. 
The idea of a computer virus is something that predates even the idea of the internet itself. Hell, it is something that even predated computer networks. There was a mathematician by the name of John von Neumann back in the late 1940s who had envisioned something like the early computer viruses, or at least an idea of what would later become a computer virus. What he envisioned was something that was capable of automatically self-replicating, an entity that could produce itself without the need for anything else. But the idea that he had back in those days was not something that was capable of being done with the technology of the time. It was not something that would be done for almost 30 additional years. The first thing to happen to make any of this possible was an experimental computer network called ARPANET, something that was created back in 1969 and was effectively a precursor to the modern internet. This was something that was designed to send communications from computer to computer over long distances without the need to connect each individual computer with a phone line. And so because the early people that were using Utilizing this network were all computer scientists that were very, you know, in touch with computers and technology. Imagine their surprise when one day they ended up receiving a message over the network that was, was not something that they ever anticipated. One day in the year 1971, a whole bunch of computers started receiving the same message. I'm the creeper, catch me if you can. Now, although these scientists didn't really know it at the time, they were the victims of the first ever computer virus. And so a lot of people are gonna look at this and they're gonna go, wait, okay, what the hell? What, what is this? What is this message? What does it mean? Who sent it? What exactly is going on here? Well, as it turns out, it wasn't actually a hacker who had sent in this first ever computer virus. And it also wasn't something that was sent with any kind of malicious intent in order to wreck the early stages of this computer technology. Oh no, no, instead all of this was created by one guy, a researcher by the name of Bob Thomas, who was actually a researcher at Bold, Baranak, and Newman, which would then later become Raytheon. He had gone and created Creeper as just a kind of experimental computer program, something that was designed to prove a point and also play a little bit of a joke. You see, in terms of types of viruses, this first ever one Creeper was a worm, that being a type of computer virus that replicates itself and then spreads to other systems. And in this case, the targets that this thing had was the Digital Equipment Corporation, or DEC computers, which were all linked to ARPANET. But as I said, this whole thing wasn't malware like what we associate today, where it's actually harmful. No, the entire thing was done to specifically prove a point as a proof of concept and also play a joke. The only thing that this thing did was spread to other computers and display this message. That's it. That is the only thing that it did. It didn't encrypt files. It didn't demand a ransom. It didn't destroy data. It didn't steal any social security numbers, it didn't do anything like that that we now associate with ransomware or other malware. Its creators simply wanted to create an experimental self-duplicating program to illustrate that something like that was even possible in the first place. It was done specifically out of scientific curiosity, and the entire thing was a joke, as I said, because it was named after a Scooby-Doo character. This guy, the Creeper. From the 70s cartoon, Scooby-Doo. The entire thing was simply a harmless little joke. But now, of course, I say that, but when we were talking about things in history and we're talking about viruses, just in the case of cancer, where there are benign tumors, there are simultaneously going to be malignant ones. Which brings us to the next section of this video, and I'm going to tell you all this right now, that if I really wanted to make this a long video, I could go over the entire history of all the different viruses and other things that have occurred over the years with all their wacky different effects, because some of them have been rather funny, others have been terrible, but all of them have their own kind of unique story. If that is something that you all would like to hear, then please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and let me know down in the comment section below. But the story that I'm going to tell you all about today is the time that the United States did a very similar thing with its own cyber weapon, Stuxnet. Well, now I say that they did this, but before I continue on with this, I have to add on the words allegedly because we're talking about something with cybersecurity. And just like in the case of China, anytime anyone is involved in any kind of cyber attack, they always refuse any degree of responsibility. The United States is not innocent in this by any means. So, okay. That brings us to a very important question here. What exactly is Stuxnet? Well, Stuxnet is an exceptionally powerful computer worm that was designed by the United States as well as Israeli intelligence that was supposed to disable a key part of the Iranian nuclear program. This was around a decade ago when the whole Iranian nuclear deal thing was going down and the United States was trying to do everything possible that it could in order to delay Iran from developing nuclear weapons. And how was Stuxnet going to help do this, you may ask? Well, I'm going to explain this as well as I can because Stuxnet exploited multiple previously unknown Windows Zero days, which I'm going to say right now, I am not a computer scientist, I know that, so I'm going to do the best that I possibly can in order to explain what exactly those are. 
A zero day, by definition, is a security flaw in which the vendor of the flawed system has yet to make a patch available for its affected users. The name ultimately derives from the world of content piracy, as if pirates are able to somehow obtain a bootleg copy of a product before it's actually released, or on the same day that it is released, then that is considered a zero day flaw. And so when we take that idea into the world of cybersecurity, the name then evokes a scenario in which the attacker has managed to get the jump on a software vendor, and is able to implement attacks that exploit the flaw before it's able to be patched. Once a zero-day attack technique is out, typically what would happen is that if a private group managed to get access to a company this way, they would end up selling that technique to other actors for big money in order to be able to make as large of a profit out of it as they could. And at that point, the clock is ticking for the vendor of that software to be able to respond in order to try and patch it, as I said. But either way, back to Stuxnet. When we are talking about the history of this particular piece of malware, it's it's now widely accepted that Stuxnet was created specifically by the intelligence agencies of the United States as well as Israel. Stuxnet was first identified by the InfoSec community in 2010, but development on this thing is probably much older, either beginning somewhere around 2005 or 2006, probably around then, though we can't say for certain. With the goal of it, as I said, was for Stuxnet to be a tool that would allow the United States as well as Israel to derail or at least slow down the Iranian nuclear program, something that would stop Iran from that being able to develop nuclear weapons that could potentially destabilize the entire region. Though when we're talking about this, it doesn't necessarily mean that Iran, as soon as they had nuclear weapons, was going to then use them on its neighbors. Rather, that this was something that was developed specifically as an emergency response in order to be able to stop and prevent Israel from launching a preemptive strike to try and take out Iran before it could use its nuclear weapons. If Israel had done so, then this is something that could have potentially set off a regional war, and as we all know how things go in the Middle East, that very quickly could have spiraled out of control to become significantly larger than any state or actor wishes to happen. The Middle East has never exactly been a place that has been a beacon of stability, after all. And although it wasn't exactly clear that such a cyber attack was even going to be possible to take out physical infrastructure at a location, after a meeting in the White House Situation Room late in the Bush presidency, the United States ended up moving forward with the plan specifically to go after the Iranian nuclear program, or at least that's what we believed has happened because, again, it's never been fully admitted. This then began the classified program to develop the Stuxnet worm, something that ended up being called Operation Olympic Games. I, I actually don't even know over the course of doing research for this video exactly why it was called that in the first place, but, you know, I mean, I, I guess if that's what they wanted to call it, why the hell not? This was something that began under President Bush and ended up continuing under President Obama, and while neither government ever fully acknowledged that they were responsible for it, Israel probably inadvertently admitted it, because what ended up happening is that in 2011, there was a video that was created in order to celebrate the retirement of the Israeli Defense Force's head, Gabi Ashkenazi. And in that video, it listed Stuxnet as one of the successes under his watch. Thus, you know, the whole interaction between the United States and Israel specifically to develop this weapon, yada, yada, yada. Y you get it. it. They inadvertently admitted it, but the United States still to this day has never officially admitted it. And because they never admitted it, and we don't have any of that other information, we don't know the individuals that went on to create this particular virus, but we do know that they were very skilled and that there probably were a lot of them. If a number of you are familiar with Casper Sky, the image that I have up here behind me right now, one of the guys over at Casper Sky who did an analysis analysis on all of this estimated that it took a team of 10 coders around two to three years in order to create a workable version of the virus, which is a lot of time, energy, and resources to be able to do this. But when we're talking about potentially stopping a nuke, yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of worth it at that point. Either way, Stuxnet ends up getting created, and at this point, a lot of people are probably wondering, okay, we have a virus, we have a worm, what exactly is this thing going to do in the first place? Well, the entire purpose of it was that Stuxnet was supposed to destroy the centrifuges that Iran was using to enrich its uranium as part of its nuclear program. And I'll explain what it is that I mean. Most uranium that occurs in nature is an isotope called U-238. However, the fissile material that is necessary for a nuclear power plant or a weapon needs to be the slightly lighter U-238. And so where the centrifuge ends up coming into all of this is that it is used to spin the uranium fast enough in order to be able to separate the different isotopes by weight via centrifugal force. 
Of course, when we're talking about centrifuges that are designed for the purposes of a nuclear power plant or nuclear weapons program, then the centrifuges in this are both delicate and simultaneously a lot of them are required. So over the course of time, it's a very normal thing for these centrifuges to break. So when Stuxnet would go and infect a computer, what it would first do is check to see if that computer is connected to a specific model of programmable logic controller, or PLC. PLCs are how computers end up interacting with and controlling industrial machinery, like uranium centrifuges. And so if no PLCs are detected over the course of that virus being in the computer, it just sits there and does nothing forever. But if they are connected to a centrifuge, that's where the magic happens. What Stuxnet would then do is alter the PLC's programming, resulting in these centrifuges spinning irregularly. Sometimes it would speed them up faster, sometimes slower, but only ever so slightly. But when we're talking about something that is as delicate as one of these centrifuges, that was still oftentimes enough for it to break. If not immediately, then far more quickly than they probably should. Meanwhile, the entire time that this is happening, the PLC is going back and telling the computer that, hey, everything is okay, nothing is wrong, don't worry about it, everything is showing normal on our end. And because of that feature, it makes the discovery of a virus like this exceptionally difficult to figure out. And oftentimes, one is not even going to be able to diagnose or figure out what is going on until it's far too late and has spread around the entire facility. See, Stuxnet was a viciously aggressive virus, something that would go after all aspects of its target's infrastructure. It would go after its Windows operating system. It would go after the Siemens software that was running on the computer to control the PLCs. And then it would also embed its software into the PLCs itself. So even if you went and put that PLC into another computer or something like that, even if you did some kind of transfer or segmentation, it would still be there. All it took to get things started was by getting it into one computer in the first place, which although difficult was possible and did happen. The way that it had to be delivered was via a removable drive, something like a USB stick. It had to be done physically and wasn't something that was possible over the internet because the Natanz facility where all of this was taking place wasn't actually connected to the internet. This was something that in the computer world was known as being air-gapped, meaning it was on its own separate network not connected to the wider world in order to make sure that things from the outside world were not going to be able to get in and infect and spy or affect it, so to speak. But yeah, that ended up not happening, and as soon as the virus was in, it could rapidly spread from computer to computer inside of the system's own network. Which, I suppose in the end, brings us to the question of, was this actually successful? And the answer is yes. Generally speaking, it is kind of hard to measure how successful something like Stuxnet was, but a number of analysts who have looked in on this have said that it delayed it by at least a good two years. In fact, this thing was so effective when it was operating that the Iranians had no idea that any of this was going on at all. It was actually outsiders that had come to the nuclear facility that first realized that, hey, something is going on. And even then, that didn't fix it. The first outsiders to go and actually notice the effects of the worm were the inspectors from the International Atomic Agency, or IAEA. These guys had been permitted access to go to the Natanz facility, and part of their job was to go and inspect the centrifuges that were being carted out of the facility in order to make sure that the Iranians were not trying to smuggle uranium using broken centrifuges over to another nuclear facility that wasn't actually being tracked by the International Atomic Agency. This was something that was a part of their regular job because, as I already talked about earlier, it was normal for these centrifuges to break over the course of operation. But the reason why these outsiders got suspicious in the first place was because there was an abnormally large amount of them that were coming out of the facility in the first place. Like, okay, over the course of doing research for this episode, I was trying to find an exact number that would say how many centrifuges one could lose. And the general number that I was able to find was anywhere between a general attrition rate of 600 to 800 per year. But the inspectors that were looking at all of this saw that the Iranians were losing things at a rate of approximately 2,000 centrifuges per year, anywhere between like three to four times the amount of centrifuges that they were supposed to. Which not only is going to be a huge loss in terms of time, but simultaneously in terms of waste of resources, having to go and buy new centrifuges because the other ones are breaking, that is another expense that is going to set the program back. 
And at the time, no one really knew what it was that was going on. Like, the inspectors understood that they were losing far more than they should, but no one could pinpoint exactly what was happening. No one had any idea that it was all a computer virus. Which, I guess, in the end, does bring us to a very important question. How exactly was Stuxnet discovered? Well, the reason that Stuxnet ended up being discovered was because it unexpectedly ended up growing beyond the Natanz facility that it was supposed to target. Now, if you'll remember what it is that I said before, this is not something that, technically speaking, should have happened if every employee was following the standard safety protocols of what you're supposed to inside of a nuclear facility. Natanz was air-gapped, meaning all of its systems should have been internal and there was no access to the outside world by which the virus should have been able to spread. And so many in the United States ended up believing that the spread was the result of code modifications that were made by the Israelis, which apparently at the time really upset Biden, who was vice president at the time under President Obama. But another possibility is that it simply could have been a irresponsible employee who ended up taking one of the computers home in order to work from home. And then the moment that he connected that laptop to the internet, well, you can probably guess what would have then happened. It would have then began to spread everywhere. And thanks to the malware's sophisticated and extremely aggressive nature, yeah, it, it naturally began to spread extremely quickly among all the varying computers inside of Iran. Then once it actually got out, Stuxnet very quickly came to the attention of the security community thanks to a call to tech support. Support. There was an office that was inside of Iran, but not tied to the nuclear program, that began to experience serious computer issues. Things like uh, their computers mysteriously rebooting, and also blue screens of death. Things that were never pleasant for any one of us who works on computers to have to deal with, but it was not something that necessarily hurt them individually. Tech support was baffled because this wasn't something that was just affecting computers that had been there for a while. It was even affecting new computers that were just brought into the office with fresh operating systems that had never before been touched. So the on-site security expert who was unable to figure out the case ended up contacting a friend of his who I have pictured here, a Belarusian by the name of Sergei Ulasin, who was working for the antivirus vendor Virus Block Ada. At the time, Ulasin was actually at a wedding reception, so he wasn't able to do much, but he stayed on the phone with his friend in order to try and talk him through the issue and figure out what was happening. Later on, Ulasin and his team would finally manage to isolate the virus and figure out just how many zero days this thing was exploiting and what exactly they were up against. They then after this would begin the process of sharing their discoveries with the wider security community and eventually Stuxnet just kind of disappeared. At least, sort of. The thing about this virus is that Stuxnet is still definitely out there. It has not vanished, but the reality of the situation is that it's just not the same kind of threat that at one point in time it was. In fact, at the time that this occurred, while Stuxnet did manage to grab a lot of headlines due to the capabilities that it had being truly insane, it was never really a threat to anyone unless you worked at a laboratory and had access to centrifuges. It just wasn't something that you really needed to worry about. And even then, we're talking more about the centrifuges that specifically were meant for uranium enrichment more than anything else. That it wasn't something that applied to even most places that already had centrifuges. Like, in the worst case scenario, if this was truly something that was affecting you, then what you'd probably end up seeing were some reboots and blue screens of death. Which, while definitely not pleasant, again, as I say this as someone who works on my computer all the the time, it's not something that would like steal your banking information and sell it on the black market or anything like that. that. That's not something that a virus like this does. No real harm would come to you necessarily. That being said, you probably still don't want your system to be infected by a powerful piece of malware. That's just not something that is ever pleasant for anyone, and especially not when developed by nations like the United States and Israel. But fortunately, the zero-day exploits that Stuxnet was using are no longer really a thing. Those have long since been patched in the decade since. And as long as you, the viewer that is watching this, is practicing at least somewhat basic cyber hygiene and being a little bit careful, you're more than likely not going to be running into any issue with any things like this. Just keep your OS software up to date, keep all the security software up to date, do everything you can to maintain the general health of your computer, and you'll be fine. But I do hope that in the end here today, that I was able to teach you all something about history and just shows how dangerous all of this malware can be. What we were talking about here between the United States and China is definitely a real threat and has the potential for things that are significantly greater than anything that I have already covered over the course of this video. But really, at this point, only time will tell and who can really say where it is that we're going to be a year or two from now. Or heck, because we're talking about cybersecurity and the cyber warfare stuff, it could even be as soon as a week from now, who really knows? 
Anyway, this has been Stakuyi with the History of Everything Podcast YouTube channel. Thank you, everyone, for watching this. I really appreciate you all. If you could like, comment, subscribe, and let me know what it is that you'd like to see in the comment section below, I would greatly appreciate it. It really does help me here in the algorithm. Also, don't forget that if you want to support me, you can check out Patreon or check out the trip that I'm leading here to Italy here this next May because there's still a couple spots left that you can sign up for. Links are down in the description, and also down there is a link to my coffee, which I promise you is delicious and you will definitely enjoy. But without further ado, everyone, thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate all of you, and I hope you have a good rest of your day. Thanks, guys, and goodbye.